The MENA Talks, a podcast series by the BIC on the Middle East and North Africa. Once a month, our hosts, along with special guests, will explore underlying historical, economic, social and political drivers behind today's systemic issues in the MENA region. The BIC is present on Facebook, YouTube and Twitter. Follow us and subscribe to receive our latest news and publications. Welcome to a new episode of MENA Talks, uh, the last of the season. My name is Yasmina Kremi. I am a research analyst at the Brussels International Centre, and I am welcome, welcoming today um, Emmanuel Mbioso, a senior research consultant at the Institute for Security Studies. Emme is a migration expert whose research Research covers a broad range of intersecting issues, including climate change, gender, refugee rights, violent extremism, and citizenship in high flow regions such as Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. Emmanuel, today we are going to talk about uh, the intersecting issue of climate and migration in Africa, uh, which I believe you, you work on quite a bit. Uh, in the framework, really, of the African Union, uh, European Union summit that is going to uh, last for two days and that is starting today, uh, February 17th until tomorrow. So it's a pretty, um, uh, it's, a, it's an important uh, summit happening, especially uh, as it was postponed uh, last year because of, uh, of COVID. Let's start about uh, really something you focus on a lot on in your work and your research, um, and that is climate resilient strategies, really. So avoiding catastrophes uh, before they happen. In your work, you talk a lot about uh, planned relocation and its importance for Africa and for African cities, um, uh, for African urbanization, really. In the framework of the EU-AU summit, um, what could or should be done to really improve or um, implement, really, climate resilient strategies? Those are some really big questions. Um, I think let's start at the top. Let's establish just a couple of things when it comes to climate-linked migration, and then we can get into some of the more details. Um, so first, well, I'll point out that the links between climate change and migration are still a little bit fuzzy. So it is really hard to isolate climate change as a driver for migration because most people, when asked, they don't say I'm migrating because the, you know, salinization, they say I'm migrating because my, I've lost my livelihood and I'm looking for new livelihood opportunities. So it's really difficult to be able to isolate that as a specific factor because across the board, climate change act, acts as a, you know, a fragility amplifier. So people who are fragile in other areas that might push them towards migration might be amplified uh, by climate change, as we say. Um, so to your point on resilience, migration in and of itself is an important adaptation strategy for climate change. Um, what you see, the most common thing that we've seen to date on it is that you have in areas where you're seeing more long-term uh, climate impacts, you're, you're seeing, it's very rare for an entire village to pick up and go somewhere. It's most likely that a family will send one individual, you know, if crops start failing or you're starting to see diminishing returns, that family is gonna send one member to go find work in a city. And that allow remittances and skills that they build in the city actually allows that family to adapt better to the climate impact. So it really diversifies the income and adds new skills um, and these factors. So that's, that's, that in and of itself is an important adaptation factor because it's, you know, some families and communities that are reliant on diminished agriculture or other in uh, primary resources that might be diminishing, this gives them some ability to get um, out of that. But it can also, increase vulnerability. So people who are forced to move, people, you know, they lose their assets, they can become dispossessed or they can be exposed to danger on their journeys. One of the biggest 
outcomes definitely that we're seeing is urbanization. So this is something that we've done quite a bit of work on. Um, urbanization, the numbers are projected to be really high in an already rapidly urbanizing continent. So a lot of people are pushing into cities and this can lead to, you know, we're already dealing with 70% of people who are in cities are living in slums. So if you have sort of uncontrolled movement of people who are going to be pushed by climate factors into cities without the cities being able to adapt in advance, you're going to end up with some pretty dire situations. So in these contexts, we start to look at planned relocation is something that we've talked about. Um, and this is a possible option to sort of uncontrolled urbanization or forced movement or immobility is something that we don't talk enough about. So those are people who are unable to move because they've become so po poor, they're in what we call the poverty trap. Um, so in, in these communities where you're dealing with irreversible climate impacts. So some communities are really impacted by sea level rise or salinization or acidification or desertification. And it's not gonna, there's no possibility to go back. Um, in some places it is definitely well worth investing in adaptation plans like early warning systems or improved infrastructure or technologies to help defeat these things. But in some, in some places it is going to be irreversible and there's no way around it. And the investment on looking at planned relocation, so moving, moving communities does potentially give the opportunity for people to stay in community and to minimize some of those losses. And again, to, to minimize people getting stuck into immobility. Um, so that's something that we have looked at, but planned relocation is definitely messy for a couple of different reasons. So one is that it hasn't really been done, um, not in Africa at least. So out of um, over 400 adaptation projects that we looked at, well, um, zero have had to do with, with relocation. So as I said, we look at, um, we try to frame adaptation, sorry, we try to frame adaptation migration as an adaptation strategy and zero plans um, to date that have been publicly financed have actually looked at any sort of movement or movement planning. Um, so that's one of the big reasons why there aren't, um, why it's still quite messy is that it, has, it really hasn't been done. There are some examples of relocation that's been done after large uh, disasters in an emergency context. So you have definitely seen some, you know, uh, relocation of entire communities following cyclones in Mozambique, um, for example, but that's very different from sort of planning upfront. And a lot of those examples haven't also haven't gone that well. So in the, uh, in about 2008, there was some cyclones in Mozambique where it, that involved part of the disaster response involved relocating the entire communities up into uh, to nearby highlands that were less prone to cyclones. Um, they did put invest some money and some resources into helping provide people with new livelihoods and uh, places to live and try and keep them in community. And over time, they found that at least 30% of the people who were relocated ended up coming back. Um, and there's a lot to learn from those situations about why they came back. Um, but probably the biggest thing is that we underestimate how much, we often underestimate how much communities want to stay in place. So people do have strong place attachment and this will range enormously. So some, you know, transient communities that are sort of in urban slums, they might be quick to, to say yes and move to, to something mm -hmm. where, there is a livelihood opportunity, but some other communities have been there for generations and generations and they, they don't want to leave. Um, Sorry, yeah. I, have, I have a question really regarding that. Yeah. Are, are these communities in general involved in the decision-making of just uh, relocation in general? Well, th they haven't been done. So as I said, they haven't really been done. They've only been done in the disaster context. So it's been brought up um, 
in in some communities it's been brought up as a possibility and it like i said it uh, it ranges but one of the key factors in globally in communities where they have done it one of the key factors from making it successful is whether or not they're involved. So it, mm. it absolutely has to be voluntary and they have to be involved in deciding where they go, how they're gonna go, what it's gonna look like. Otherwise it's a waste of time, absolutely. Mm. You know, again, the framework of, of the summit and I'm trying to link, you know, um, uh, the fates of, of, of both continents or at least um, um, detect intersecting interests really. Uh, so, Europe is moving toward uh, a green transition. And, and I think you talked about that in, in your last article and your latest article. Um, uh, in that green transition uh, could negatively impact African countries who are uh, exporting fossil fuel. Uh, and you talked in your, in your uh, article about um, uh, the necessity for Europe and Africa to see the same shade of green. I like that expression. Um, is, is that on the agenda today? Is intersecting interest and really working together for, um, for a green transition um, is that possible? And does that really um, uh, work with, with African countries' interests uh, in, in general? I know there's a difference. Uh, and I know like some of them import, some of them export, so that you know, African mm -hmm. countries cannot be generalized. But do you see that as a possibility uh, to um, really work together on a green transition? I mean, it has to be possible. I think it's a necessity. Um... And that's the bottom line. And I, I think what you see in the green transition parallels sort of what we see in adaptation. So I definitely work more and look more at adaptation. Um, and, and one thing that I found while researching adaptation is only 3% of the projects that have been implemented to date, to date are actually at a place where you can see if they're working. So I think we because it's urgent, because climate action is so urgent, um, it's still quite new actually. And so the rollout of, of projects and the synergizing of different strategies is actually, it's not there yet. So in my recent article where I spoke about, yeah, I spoke about the need to sort of, to, for Europe to consider Africa in its planning and for it to be a key component of the summit. And the, you know, the AU indicated leading up to the summit that they weren't gonna talk that much about the green transition. And that's because they weren't, it wasn't clear to them yet how EU proposals were gonna impact um, the continent as a whole. And as you said in your introduction, there's many different contexts uh, to consider when it comes to energy. Some are energy exporters, some, uh, are energy importers, but are also ripe for uh, investment in renewable energies. And as we say, they can leapfrog the dependence on fossil fuel. So it is definitely important to look at, you know, the, the context specific, what the AU and African countries are calling for is just some clarity. So, you know, as the EU winds down on carbon, what will it mean for African countries? And you can't expect to sort of, you know, generate hydrogen in Namibia or wind in Namibia and expect that to replace oil imports from Mozambique because they have nothing to do with each other. And Mozambique is not going to be able to sustain that loss. So, you know, you have to, these are just the details. I think it's the detail level that we're just not quite at. And that's why they... I think they retreated from it is, is we have the broad statements and we have the plans at a large level, but what does it actually look like as it's rolled out? And I think the other thing that we honed in on in that article was the hypocrisy. So I think, you know, it's really important to note that the, you know, the Europe's biggest import from Africa is energy. And so if we're saying, no, no, don't build gas, don't build any more natural gas, don't, in, an, in a context where most people are, or sorry, not most, but there's still a large percentage of Africa that is in an energy deficit. It's, and energy is fundamental to development. It's really difficult 
to propose, hey, stop any energy um, development, uh, but we'll just keep doing it until we find a solution for ourselves. So I think a big answer to all of this, and this has been an undercurrent of all negotiations, and this is something I try to say in every time that I talk or write about it, is that it's really important to remember that Africa produces 3% or three, depending on the calculation, but a tiny percentage, three to 4% of global emissions and even less historically, but will bear the brunt of, of the impacts. And so I think it's really important just, yeah, to frame it that way, um, that this is the people who've done the least to create the problem are bearing the brunt of, of it. Um, and that's, you know, one reason why we need to be compelled to really ramp up both mitigation and adaptation. Today, when we talk about migration from a Western perspective, specifically a European perspective here, we tend to frame it always in a uh, security matter. Uh, so we talked in Brussels today and tomorrow in the framework of, of the summit um, are really gonna be focused uh, on readmission, on preventing um, um, irregular migration, on dismantling smuggling routes, which, when I read your work and the work of other people who really are, um, uh, you know, working on Africa, not just Africa from an, from a Western perspective, um, uh, it it's, it feels very very distant from you know uh, um, problems. I want to say in the field, like, for example, uh, fast urbanization because of climate change or other or other aspects. So um, do you think uh, a, a intersecting interests or overlapping interests are possible between, uh, between Africa and Europe on the issue of migration? Um, again, I really hope so, <laughs> because it's, it's really, it's important. Um, and I, I think the, at the core of this is the narrative that, um, you know, African migrants are overwhelming Europe. And there, there was a real shift in that around, in and around when Syrian migrants were, uh, you know, 2015 was the peak year. But we've established and we reestablish annually at this point that those numbers went shooting up um, over 1 million back in 2015 and then they, they crashed back down. Um, so the number of actual migrants arriving to Europe hasn't increased um, dramatically, but it has become politicized. So that's your major change mm. is that it's become politicized. And, and consistently African migrants make up a, a small fraction uh, year after year of the people who arrive in Europe. And it has become a hotly contested political issue within the EU. And that's why I think it stays um, as a topic. So it's obviously the external countries considered a major problem because it's a very, you know, when you see a boat full of people, it is a shocking image. When you see people drowning, when you see a boat, even if the number of people on that boat is half of what's on an airplane, it looks dramatic. Um, and it's obviously, you know, internally, the EU hasn't come up with any good, as I'll say it, they haven't come up with any good solutions to this, um, to this issue, but that's an internal EU is issue as I see it. But a massive part of the solution, and I say solution with quote quotation marks, is to push border externalization into Africa. There's been millions and millions and millions of euros that have gone towards uh, commissioning Libyan mm. militia to turn boats around, to act as a coast guard, um, to reinforce borders in areas of the Sahel that were previously borderless, so they're deserts just sand. Um, there are, and the impacts of that can't be underestimated. So you, you know, you have freedom of movement in, you know, the, the West African states and you have Africa as a whole that's working towards 
freedom of movement and the pushing of these securitized measures and the leveraging of sort of development funds for cooperation around securitizing borders and stemming migration. Um, and we use people smuggling really as a, a, you know, as a token, like obviously nobody likes people smugglers, but they're not at the core of the issue. Um, and there'd be far less people smuggling if there were more regular methods for people to move. And we've said that over and over again. But one of the impacts, you know, we can't underestimate the trickle down impacts of those securitized measures. So you have reports, you know, one report that we did at the ISS took a look at Agadez. So that's a city in uh, Niger. It's a desert city where at one point they were selling life jackets because about one third of the migrants who passed by boat into Europe reported that they had come through Agadez at some point. And in that, and it's desperately poor, there had been some mining in the region that had shut down. And so one of the EU proposals was to really shut down the smuggling industry that was quote unquote thriving in Agadez. And that was, you know, you do, there was a, an industry that, that flared up there and that meant restaurants and hotels and taxi drivers and people that were shuttling people from A to B. And that was a really thriving industry that gave livelihoods in and around Agadez. And the EU came in and effectively crushed it and, and had some plans to replace the livelihoods for the people in Agadez but it was too slow. So sort of the plans to, you know, to, to revitalize certain things or to give people livelihoods, they were a year past when it, was, when it was crushed. And what you found was that the prices of smuggling went up. So the livelihood of your regular um, residents who, you know, had restaurants and were selling bread and Coca-Colas to people was crushed. And then the prices of smuggling went up and it went to more organized smugglers. So people were still coming through, they were coming through at a higher cost and they were paying organized criminal groups to do smuggling through uh, more dangerous routes. Mm. So the wrong people profited from it and the wrong people um, were, were crushed by it. And I don't think that was the the intention, obviously that wasn't the intention, but these are some of the byproducts that, that, that happen. And, and so when we look at climate migration, I think I said from the, from the top, there's this overwhelming narrative that, um, and it even came up at COP26. So Boris Johnson opened the, the conference by saying, you know, one of the reasons we should be paying attention to climate change is because we're going to get overwhelmed by millions of people from around the world who are fleeing from diminishing resources. Mm -hmm. And he wrongly said that that's why Rome fell. So Rome fell because they were overwhelmed by external migrants. And it's going to happen again to us. No. Um, and we and we hear that all the time. But we've established and everyone's established over and over again that climate migration is predominantly local. It takes a lot of money to get from to get overseas, to cross continents. So you're looking, what you're gonna see is mostly internal migration. And if we are funding securitized borders and if we're training people to reframe migration from something that we encourage to something that is, needs to be securitized, then that's gonna have very real trickle down impacts mm -hmm. um, in many different ways. Uh, yeah, so what, yes, one of the things that, that I have written about is is the impacts in Libya, where what we've seen is the, it, the EU funding and the returning of migrants before they reach external EU borders by boat has funded, um, has created a market for the militia to, to uh, basically extort people and to put them into detention where they're able to extort or traffic people um, and fund yeah warfare that is destabilizing further destabilizing Libya so these the impacts are are, are quite large um, we could talk about how destabilized Libya factors into migration but you can see that that these aren't what's being considered at the table at the top but these are yeah. some of the trickle-down effects and the 
as far as we're con concerned, the ends don't, the means don't justify the end. So the amount of money that's going in to prevent sort of tens of thousands of people from arriving at external European borders each year, which doesn't end up being that much, it doesn't, it doesn't add up, at least not from African perspective. Mm. This is very interesting. I never thought of uh, how, you know, trying to, to push Europe's borders into, into Africa, mostly North Africa, uh, is really uh, preventing freedom of movement within the continent. I never thought of that. Thank you a lot, Emmanuel. Was, this was very, very informative, very interesting for me. I think it's a great, you know, uh, last episode for the season. Uh, and I really, really enjoyed this conversation uh, with you. I hope you, you did too. Thank you, Yasmin. And thanks for the patience. <laughs> This is all for today, and uh, we hope to um, uh, see you uh, in our next episode and our next season. Thank you for listening to another episode of the MENA Talks. Share your thoughts with us on social media with the hashtag, hashtag MENA Talks, and follow us to receive our latest news and updates. The MENA Talks is a podcast series on the Middle East and North Africa, an initiative of the Brussels International Centre.